What's going on, everybody? We're back once again with yet another podcast episode of The Push with your hosts. I am Dominic Mallon and our host, Cassidy Haynes. Good morning, everybody. And uh, let's just get into it right now. Podcast! 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 We cast them! Our award-winning intro. That was it. And uh, we have a very special episode. So every episode we do is special, but I think this one especially is uh, one that I was really excited to be able to land. It is Gregory Irons, professional wrestler. Nope, and nope. it's singular. It's Iron. Get it right, my man. Oh, are you kidding me? I screwed it I'm up on the intro? You screwed it up on the intro. It's Gregory <laughs> Iron. That's a Twitter thing. It's a Facebook what? Twitter thing. I said all the time. You're correcting oh, sh- oh, my Bush God. League, I'm brother. such a schmuck. Bush League, brother. Oh, my God. I'm going to keep it in so everybody knows how yeah, We'll awful. fix it in post. We'll fix it in post. Oh, my God. I'm going to keep that in. Greg, <laughs> I am so sorry, dude. I, I, I couldn't even – you couldn't even say a word before I already screwed this up. But welcome to my shitty rendition of this show, The Push. <laughs> Hello, Dom. I, I, thought, I thought we were tighter than that, man. But, but you had to throw in the S, man. It's, it's, it's been happening since day one of my wrestling career. But uh, it's okay. I forgive you. I oh my god I feel awful and I even Don't. I saw both and I thought that Irons was the official one. No, I no. should feel I should feel awful. We're more professional than that. Cass is more professional than that, and I'm bringing as him- as my as my lawyer. I'm a, I'm I'm upset with you. I'm, I'm lawyerish <laughs> for another at least year and a half, depending on how many times I got to take the bar exam. But for for uh, what's it called for uh, my cousin Vinny, six times was a charm. So who knows? <laughs> I'm doing too much talking, Greg. Thank you so much for coming Sorry. on. Oh, thanks oh, for I'm having me. I'm excited to have Greg uh, on, man. The last second. <laughs> yeah, man. Greg, I'm gonna, Greg, and I've known each other a long time, man. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we, uh, glad we were able to do this this morning, man. Hell yeah, I'm excited. Well, and you guys have known each other a long time, but I think a lot of people have known you for a long time. I mean, you've, you've made a name for yourself since for, for years now. I mean, it's not like you're new on the wrestling scene, and uh, you know, we can get into a million different reasons. Um, why there's so so many things that are so special about you um but let's let's just start with what 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 you've been doing recently and what you're doing now because everybody knows who you are greg you know except for my dumbass who doesn't know your your last name (laughs) but uh but i mean you've been you've been doing this and and you've been making a name for yourself since i mean 2013 you were featured in in pro wrestling illustrated's top 500 and yeah that's i mean that's over five years ago and you're still doing your thing now. You've only grown since then. Uh, what's what are you up to now? What are you up to recently? Uh, and before COVID, at least, because I feel like nobody's doing anything since COVID. Yeah, well, uh, I'm I'm staying busy, fortunately, despite the COVID. Uh, GCW still running shows, and and I'm a very prominent figure in 440, which arguably is the greatest faction not just heel faction in wrestling but greatest faction in wrestling and that's keeping me very busy and uh i'm just trying to stay positive and motivated and really just the whole whole 440 thing is really keeping me uh grounded and humble because not a lot of wrestlers are getting work right now and so to be in like that that kind of elite class of guys that are are staying steady with the wrestling and selling merch and just getting out there and, and staying relevant on social media. It's, it's, it's pretty humbling to be honest with you. So it's, you know, I, I was watching some of the YouTube stuff and some of your heel work. The one I saw one pro heel promo that you did where you were turning on the fans and it, it was the type of venue where you can really hear every criticism coming at you. And some of those criticisms were ridiculous and just the way that you just shot it all down and stayed on your stride, it's insane to think that you're such a good heel when in reality you're such a good person and you just seem like such a, such a nice person to talk to. Um, how do you tap into that type of just kind of just heel mentality when you go there? Well, I guess it goes back to channeling things that I really feel. You know, when the idea of me being a bad guy – geez, I think eight years ago was pitched to me. It was in AIW in Cleveland and they wanted to turn me heel because a section of the crowd was turning against me, but they didn't have a reason for me. I I asked them, you know, how do you want me to go about this? And they said, I don't know, you're just going to be a bad guy now. And luckily I had all the ammunition in my back pocket to be a bad guy because I could go back to that place where 
I was a kid and I was bullied for being different and for having cerebral palsy. And I remember always thinking, you know, as I got older and I realized my brand of humor and my wit, uh, I, I guess I, when guys would make fun of me at school, I would think to myself, like, that's not even like a good joke. If you're going to make fun of me, you should say this, you know, and I would, and I would make fun of myself better than other people would. But at the same time, like there was this anger that was building up inside of me. And like, I'd see these people that are making fun of me and they like, and call me disabled or crippled or retarded. And I would look at them and think to myself, like, how could you make fun of me? Like, look at yourself. Like you're fat, you're cross-eyed, you smell like shit. And like, it just all these things like would come to mind. Like, like it phased me, but like in a different way, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, like, how can you throw stones at me when you're not looking much better, man? Like physically, I technically have a dis disability, but like, look in the mirror, like what you have could also be considered a disability, not just outside, but inside as well, because you're such a piece of shit. And so I took those feelings and that anger. And when it was pitched to me to be a bad guy, I remember thinking to myself, you just take everything that's good about the character and you flip it on people. And you, you, you take that anger, that visceral feeling that I always had in me as a child, and you turn it against people and make them think, you know, I know Greg is disabled, but I think he's kind of a piece of shit, you know, like you take these things that you see in other people that they may not think is true and you pull it out of them and you bring it to the surface. Like I'll give you a perfect example. When I was younger, um, my dad used to always make fun of my acne. Okay. And it was one of those things where I had really bad acne and I'd go and like look in the mirror for like hours before school. And I would, I would think to myself, it doesn't look that bad. You know, my skin's only a little red. And then I'd walk out of the bathroom and my dad would immediately go, Oh, what's up pepperoni face or something. And I'd be like, Jesus Christ. Like, I guess like it's pretty noticeable. Right. But like, I I'm mad at him now because he called me out on it. And so at AIW initially, when I started, I had the, um, I had the ability to know some of these fans on a more personal level and you can kind of gauge with people what their insecurities are. And so it was, they were targeting me for being this white meat baby face. So I was able to take some of their qualities that I would see at every show. And in that, I think the promo you're talking about, I'm sitting up on the top turnbuckle yep. and I was able to like look individually at like some of those fans that would always come to the front row and like make fun of me. And like, I could kind of channel, like what they were insecure about or what I thought they would be insecure about. And I brought it to the surface. And I think that's what makes a good bad guy is like, you're able to pull things out of people that they can't admit to themselves. And if you could do that and go make them go, uh, Oh my God, like you're a piece of garbage for, for bringing that out or bringing that up. Uh, I think that makes the best bad guy. And if I believe it, that makes it even better because I'm, I'm an even bigger piece of garbage for thinking that's a, a real issue, you know, that, that I'm, I'm right in pulling those things out. So it's, it's really a multi-level level, uh, discussion when you talk about me being a bad guy. There's, there's shades of gray. Uh, you know, you said that that goes into making a good bad guy. I think that's what goes in, in my, in my personal opinion, that's what goes into making an amazing bad guy. To be able to, to sit there and wrestling fans have the, the tendency to just be shitty people. Um, and, and maybe it's not the majority of them, but it's, we, you know, a lot of times we, we call it the vocal minority, I guess, on, on Twitter or, so, you know, social media, whatever. And good bad guys know how to get them mad. Great bad guys know how to get under their skin and really make them get heat. And somebody like you, who I think only the worst type of people could look at anybody that has gone through what you've gone through and just naturally want to boo them, right? Most people, most general, I would like to think most people are generally good and won't want to boo somebody unless they deserve to get booed. And for you to find a way to even make those shitty people feel justified in booing somebody who otherwise should deserve so much praise for everything that they've gone through, I think that speaks to being an amazing heel. And uh, even though everybody knows you and you are already a brand name, uh, you know, it's a shame that I, with all the platforms that there are, that a, a heel as good as you with the work that you do um, isn't on national television every week, in my opinion. But that's just me. Oh, dude, I, I, I agree. I think it's just money right there waiting to be made, man. You as a heel on TV, it's, it's nobody would expect. 
it's not gonna be what they expect you know what i mean and then just they're gonna just love to hate you man it's it, i you're great at it i would i agree with dom right there 100 percent. i i appreciate that but the thing is though like like so in reality like i don't think i i deserve anything you know i just i think i know that i work hard for things and you know you get the opportunities that you make for yourself and and fans i don't necessarily think they're idiotic there there are like a portion of them that feel entitled and, and that's fine and everybody's welcome in their opinion if you don't like gregory iron that's that's okay but i think what what is beautiful about being a bad guy and being able to channel that part of my character is that when fans do boo me i understand the importance of me going into that mindset of being entitled as a bad guy you know like the idea that uh you turn everything that's good about the character and you flip it but at the same time while i'm arguing that i'm not disabled and you're disabled and i deserve to be treated like everyone else at the same time i would do things like in state that i have a four count rule via my lawyer to make sure that the odds are even when in reality now it's just fucked up because i get an extra second which changes everything for me. And then like, you know, the second something goes wrong, I'm crying about it, how about this injustice and how everything's unfair, but then I have this completely unfair rule in my favor. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just all psychology and mind manipulation. I think that's like the beauty of like being a bad guy and just really in this day and age, especially in social media, you've got to be able to troll the trolls in a, in the most, PC way possible so it doesn't come back to bite you in the ass because we also live in an age where anything you say and do as a bad guy or, or just as a person in general can be flipped into something that it's totally not. And, and that's, I mean, that's cancel culture for you, right? You know, Cass told me this was going to happen, but I am plutonically falling in love with you right now. Everything you say is just like, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my God. Before you stop talking, there's like three different things that it's like, oh, yeah, I want to go off that. I want to go off that. You just, you're, you're just hitting it on the head, man. Um, and trolling the trolls in, like you said, the most PC way possible so that, you know, you're getting under their skin, but they're the only ones that look like schmucks about it. And, yeah. Uh, One of the things I like to do recently is when someone tweets something bad at me, uh, I immediately look at their profile pic, which is usually like the worst uh, angled profile pic possible they look like complete garbage and so whatever they say to me my response is just okay but then i respond with a picture of themselves uh and so like it's it's kind of like the ultimate insult and then then they get even angrier like oh okay you just looked at my first profile pic and then like i'll post like another pic from their page of themselves i'm like all right and it's just, it's just keep it going you know like so like i'm not saying anything bad but they know that i'm making fun of them for being a exactly yeah. you just put it on blast and then you let probably 500 people just comment on it and just put them on blast for themselves so that's Pretty the best much. kind of heat yep. um i you know i i really don't want to make this about the wrestler with cerebral palsy um, cause you're, there's so much more to you than that. And you've already proven that for years that, that that's, that's not just you. That's a part of what you've had to over, you know, what you've had to deal with your whole life. And that's a big part of who you are to this day, but it's not all that you are. Um, but that being said, simple things that every wrestler, well, things that are probably simple for every wrestler you probably have to work twice as hard for some of these things, like keeping a physical shape, keeping a physique like you do. And, you know, again, I'm telling you, I'm plutonically falling in love with you here, but okay. um, you don't look like somebody that doesn't work out. You don't look like somebody that's not committed in the gym and certain, I'm sure certain exercises are probably more difficult for somebody that doesn't have as much capacity on both arms. Uh, what, what ways have you tried to kind of, adapt your your workout regimens to be able to stay as in shape as you are well you know uh, it comes down to simplicity first and foremost like uh it you can't out train a shitty diet so diet's very important and you know when you talk about me adapting things to um i guess better lifts for my body type and my situation for the most part there's not a lot of adaptation in terms of like i don't know I, i'll put it like this Every time someone comes at me and goes like, oh, I can't believe you wrestle with one arm. Like, how do you do it? I always go, well, I don't know. How do you wrestle with two arms? Like, I, <laughs> all I know is how to wrestle with one arm, right? So it's like you take what you have and you make the best of it. In my case, having the understanding that I wrestle different, um, 
wrestling is about creating logic out of the illogical. Um, because if you overanalyze wrestling at its core, whipping a guy into the ropes and then flying back at you is pretty stupid. Wrestling in general is, is dumb if you overanalyze it. But that, that was that my dad's world, argument as a kid. My dad was like, that was my, cause my dad didn't like wrestling. My mom did, but my dad hated it. And my dad would be like, look, he just threw me the ropes. All you gotta do is not run. This is fucking stupid. And he would just yell right. at me for it. So I'm like, well, you're right. stop nitpicking and just yeah. whatever. Right. But, but in that wrestling world, like, that is, that's a thing that happens, right? And there's, there's some things in wrestling that, like, that's just the way it works. And so you have to take logic in life and apply it to wrestling. And even though wrestling is illogical, you have to make sense of it. And that's the best way to, to describe it, you know? So I knew going into wrestling that I need to make being a one-armed wrestler in a world full of two-armed wrestlers make as most sense as possible. And so... I try to apply that same logic to everything that I do outside of the ring and in the gym, you know, um, if I had a hard time doing regular bench press, I had to figure out, well, how does a guy with one arm do that safely? And so um, my left arm is usually slightly more towards the center of the bar than my right. So that way, for some reason, uh, my arms go out on me. I have my left arm to protect me. And then, I discovered lifting straps when I was very early on into lifting. And so I would wear a lifting strap on my right hand because um, sometimes my right hand will just open and I'll lose grip. But the lifting strap allows me to hold on to a dumbbell for a little bit longer. So I can do shoulder shrugs without a problem or I can do deadlifts without a problem. So it's really just figuring out your particular situation and adapting and make it work. One of my favorite things to say, uh, as a catchphrase, but also when I talk to kids in school is you find an excuse or you find a way. There's hundreds of reasons why you can't do something, but if you really want to do something, you'll find a way to do it. And that, and that's why, like, I'm going off on a tangent, but like, that's why I hate, like when people have new year's resolutions, like, you know, starting first of the year, I'm going to do this. And it's like, you know, you could do that right now if you want to. I, I, why start, in, in a month or two months or, or tomorrow, you could start right now. And it's, it's all up to your, to your mindset and your attitude towards things. Perspective. If you change your perspective, the world shifts around you. Uh, you, you say you ramble and I, 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 every time you stop talking, I'm like, no, don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 dude, don't apologize. Look, I, I wanted to ask that question, but I, I, I wanted to also just focus so much on your mentality because I think you have such an amazing and, and the more you talk the more I want to focus on it because especially today in today's world and I think so many people have just gotten so used to having excuses to not go that extra mile or to play it safe and and not do this or that or get out of their comfort zone um, you're somebody who seems to throughout their whole life just attack that and uh, really look at that as, a, as an opportunity to overcome yet another hurdle, another obstacle. And today, when you look around at wrestling fans or even just the, the culture that we're in, is that a kind of a heater for you to see just the average person maybe just falling off a lot easier when uh, it's come so naturally to you to just not listen to those excuses and just go? Um sometimes it, it like it's a heater for me like you know I've always had this chip on my shoulder since childhood especially you know it's like that Stone Cold Steve Austin mentality of if you tell me I can't do something I'm gonna prove you wrong each and every time it, it just drives me to be better and I don't even think that's like a, a cerebral palsy or a disability thing it's just you know based on the way I grew up if you take cerebral palsy out of the the equation yeah I had a rough childhood my Parents were always at odds with each other physically and mentally. Uh, they could be physically and mentally abusive to me. Um, and so like that's, as I'm, as I'm getting older, more so now as an adult, more than when I was a teenager, like I'm realizing how those things affected me profoundly. And um, I think what helps me is that um, I've always been an open book. And so I have no problem sharing those aspects of my life. And I think in a lot of ways, that's been therapeutic for me because not only have I been able to share that um, as a person, but I think through wrestling, I use those things as a, a large part of my story. And 
you know, I, I, I'll be completely transparent. It's not like when I began wrestling that my idea was, you know what, I'm going to share my story about being disabled and coming from a broken home because I know that it'll help other people. I didn't know that. I was an angry, pissed off teenager that wanted to prove everybody who told me I couldn't do something wrong. In a lot of ways, I was sharing that those parts of my story to, I don't want to say embarrass my parents, but I didn't know how to verbalize it to them that I was angry and I had been uh, affected by the, the things that they said and they, and they did. Perfect example, when I told my dad at 16 I wanted to be a wrestler after seeing Zach Gowan uh, and I wanted to lift weights, he laughed at me. And to make it even worse, the next week we went on a uh, camping trip in West Virginia. And so not only did he laugh at me the week before, but now he's telling his drinking buddies that I want to be a wrestler and I want to lift weights. So now him and his, his grown adult friends are laughing at me for my dream. And so like that always stuck with me and like it drove me to when I got a weight bench, I wasn't lifting weights necessarily to be a wrestler at that point. I was lifting weights to prove my dad wrong and to prove like any friends that were like laughing at me and thought it was stupid that I wanted to be a wrestler. So when I became a wrestler and I was able to verbalize these things, I think I wanted just to put the whole story out on front street and let people know, let my parents know like, Hey, I'm doing this. Let my friends know, Hey, I'm doing this. But in the grand scheme of things, what I realized very quickly is that by being so open and honest and sharing my story, I had people coming up to me and go going, Hey, I know someone with cerebral palsy, or I have a disability, or I came from a broken home. And like what you say I can relate to and like that pushes me to be better. That motivates me to do this and that. And then it clicked with me like, oh God, like this is something so much bigger than me. This is something so much bigger than wrestling. It's one of those things where, um, I don't know, sharing your own personal story transcends professional wrestling. And I realized that like I got this fulfillment that I had always been looking for by helping others, I guess. And so I guess to answer your question, when I see people struggling or not working as hard, there's a little bit of frustration. And like, if they need advice and like want to talk to me about it, like I'm always an open book and, and willing to share what I've been through and help them out. Um, but I do at some level, particularly like physically, like when someone sees me in a locker room, I'm not the biggest guy in the world, but I do try to stay in shape. I want another wrestler to, to see me from across the room who might not be in the best shape, who's been using an excuse of, well, I just don't have the time to go to the gym or something or whatever the case may be to see me and go, man, if this guy with one arm is doing it, why can't I do it? You know, like, I just, I just want to push people to be better and just be them best selves. And not everybody has to be a body guy, you know, like we're in a different time where not everybody's the biggest or the strongest charisma goes a long way. Athleticism goes a long way, but, um, I think everyone should strive to be their best self and just be an open book. Yeah, you know, I'm not telling you to share your whole life story, but it, it's for me, it's felt a lot better just putting my story out there and just letting people know that, hey, I'm vulnerable. I've been hurt. This is what I've been through, but this is where I'm at now. And it's really taken me farther than I could have ever imagined. Yeah. And it, and it's awesome. And, and it's and it's all on you. It's not because of any breaks that were given to you or anything like that. Uh, I read somewhere that, you know, that when you first started out doing shows and wrestling, you, you, it took you years just before you were even making a paycheck from it. So it's, uh, it's definitely something that you, you worked hard for. Um, obviously any, any pro wrestler works hard for, and, and I think that's one of the things that in, in my personal opinion is just so beautiful about your mentality is I think it's gotta be hard for anybody to be a pro wrestler at all let alone in COVID when you're working so hard just to be able to get paid at these live shows and, and get your name out there so that you can push your merch and there's no opportunity for it. So for somebody that is in that field to be so positive, just on blanket, if you take away everything else that you've had to go through to have your mentality and just every day attack each day, kind of, kind of mindset, I think is rare and unique and valuable. You add on everything that you just talked about, and it's like you really are just a gem in not just the the wrestling industry, but I think in everybody in America can probably take a take learn a page for out of your book. And uh, I'm just so honored to have you on. I mean, we could keep you on for as long. I know you have some some bookings that you need to get to later, uh, so you let us know when you want to wrap up. 
but um i'm here for as long as you need me brother beautiful Cass, I, I feel like I keep talking over you too. Oh no, man. I, I, Greg and I talk all the time, man. So I'm, I'm enjoying listening to you guys talk because he and I shoot the shit, shit regularly. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, I'm listening. I'm just enjoying listening to you guys talk, man. I'll, I'll jump in there when I got something to chime in and add to. Don't worry. All right. Well, I think if I, if I keep focusing on just your, your, positivity and your mentality then i'm going to raise some questions to the listeners so i'm going to get off of that just so i can stop marking out on you and uh get into now you, you've been weightlifting like you said since you were 16 years old uh do you get into any other sports as well being in cleveland it's a big sports town you got a lot of different uh pro sports out there uh i mean i've always been a big cleveland indians fan but uh other than that like i don't really get into those uh fake sports man i really try to focus on the real stuff like wrestling uh but but i but i've always a big baseball guy specifically you know um i always go back to the the indians of the uh mid to late 90s just sure. uh, what a time to be a baseball fan in general and uh oh, man you know, speaking like, of the like, 90s indians how about that 1995 series that my braves played you guys in? Uh, that was well yeah so that, uh, was, that was sad that was a sad situation but it wasn't as bad as 97 when uh jose mesa really dropped the ball in the uh ninth inning of uh the world series when literally they were bringing the world series trophy into the indians dugout and they pulled it out the last second because mesa fucked up and uh, i remember legitimately uh, i only cried for wrestling up until that point and i i cried when the indians lost the 97 world series like that's how emotionally invested i was and then when they went back in 2016 like i i'm not the most diehard baseball fan i haven't kept up i try to keep up with the indians but when the indians went to the 2016 world series i felt like that kid from 97 again and i was like rooting for him the whole time and uh that that game against the cubs like it went in extra innings and it was just uh man you couldn't you couldn't write a story more dramatic than that and of course in the end the indians lost again because cleveland doesn't win much of anything but <laughs> <laughs> but it is what yeah. it is, you know, Cle- Cleveland people are fighters and then that's really cool to me. Yeah. And I feel like, uh, I feel like Cleveland really gets a bad rap for, you know, a lot of like you, when you see pictures of Cleveland, everybody shows like power plants and stuff like that, but like, it's a fun town too, right? Like it, there's a lot going on in Cleveland. It's not like, it's just like a, uh, you know, bed by nine kind of place I would think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm a little biased because I'm from here, but, uh, you know, I think we have a lot of great restaurants. We have a lot of great things to do. And, uh, we're we're a big city but i feel like we're not like an an overly busy city especially over the years where i've traveled so much it's like when you're a clevelander and you haven't left cleveland and you're bitching about the traffic i think to myself why don't, why don't you go to philadelphia or new jersey or los angeles and see like what, what the traffic or atlanta. Really looks like. yeah or atlanta <laughs> you know, like the traffic in cleveland is not that bad there there are so many things to do so many great places to eat and uh we have, you know, if you're into sports, the, the sports fans are diehard. They don't give up because if they did, they would have given up on the Browns a long time ago. I know I did. Um, so just Cleveland is a place I love. And, and while I go other places and there's, there's places that I call like my home away from home, for me, there's no better home than Cleveland, Ohio. And that's good to hear. I mean, you see a lot of people, I think when, when you talk to people in the, in the industry, they kind of want to get out of where they grew up or uh or enjoy being able to see the world and and i think that's important too seeing other areas i think a lot of that selfish mentality that a lot of americans have comes from uh, a lack of really being able to physically see beyond their neighborhood or beyond their their town so maybe justifiably so for those people or uh you know arguably so you can understand their reasoning maybe they only focus on what's in front of them how you know the the laws or whatever um anything focus, you know, helps them, benefits them, not just any, anybody, everybody. And I think that breeds itself to that kind of selfish type of, you know, me first mentality. And I've found that a lot of people that get to travel more and, and see how things are in other towns, other states, other nations really get a better understanding of, no, it's different elsewhere. You got to help other people, even if it's just to go on vacation, you know, and get out of the, out of the, the element. Um, so, I think pro wrestling and obviously somebody like you who's so well traveled uh, lends itself to being able to see that. And, and I think it's seen in your mentality, how you understand helping other people and your inspirational speaking that you do. Um, you know, everything you do is outward. It's not 
selfish. Um, and I think that's something that unfortunately there's not enough of in our country today. So it's, it's so nice to be able to hear that from somebody who has such a, a big platform. I appreciate that. And, and one thing that's been humbling over the years about seeing different parts of the world is as a pretty poor kid growing up in the lower west side of Cleveland, you know, I, I used to be a big fan of television shows like Full House, for example. It's one of my all time favorite shows. In fact, when they rebooted it with Fuller House. Dude, we was, talked about that. I was about to say, I think me and you had like a two hour conversation about Fuller House when it came, uh, when it came back out. So, yeah. It's a, it's, it's a pretty great thing. And like literally, uh, I would not take wrestling bookings the day Fuller House dropped on Netflix. Like that's, that's how serious we're talking here. So um, to be able to, to get out and travel and like, and it sounds ridiculous to people that I guess as kids could just travel places, but like the idea of like my mom and dad paying for me and my brother to go on an airplane somewhere and see something was ridiculous to me. I never left Ohio until probably the first time when I was 16 to go on that camping trip in West Virginia, which was like three hours away from me. And so, you know, I was, I had this moment where I was like, kind of like on a downturn mentally um, from my personal life, maybe three years ago, I went through a horrible breakup with a girl that I was with for five years and uh, it was mentally tough. And there's, there's still moments where that still is mentally tough because when you're with someone for so long, um, the idea that you don't see that person every day anymore. And, and like uh, the thought process of like, what if we were to cross paths and like, we have to pretend like we don't know each other, even though we've seen each other every day for such an extended period of time, it's kind of a mind fuck. Um, but then I had this moment when I was in San Francisco three years ago and I was getting paid to wrestle. Um, and I did a couple of days, like it was in San Francisco, Oakland. Um, I would work for hood slam. I worked for all pro wrestling out there. And one of my buddies lives out in San Francisco who used to train with me when I first started. And I spent a couple of days with him. And I remember I was walking around one of the parks in San Francisco and I had just seen the golden gate bridge. And uh, that's something that I only saw in full, full house as a kid, you know, and I saw Mrs. Doubtfire's house from the movie. And uh, as I'm walking around this park, I'm thinking to myself, I'm in California, which I could never even imagine is a thing. I didn't pay to be here. I'm getting paid to be here. And uh, I had my headphones on, listening to my music and just seeing the sights and like feeling the air against my skin. And I remember just thinking, you know, life isn't that bad. You know, you got to really appreciate and take in moments like that and appreciate them for what they are. Just like um, it, when I'm in the ring, you know, I try to really take in those moments a lot more the past few years and like appreciate what I have or like the m mentality when I first started wrestling where the old timers would always tell you, well, don't don't take pictures with other wrestlers. You look like a mark like, you know, one day I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to be a wrestler anymore. It's just uh, I'm not going to be able to do it. And so I realize and understand the importance of like pictures and videos and having those memories because this isn't forever. We're temporary. This is temporary. And uh, not to go on a big rant, but you know, I, I'm not the most religious guy in the world either. And I often wonder, you know, if there isn't an afterlife, maybe the only memories we have, you know, for an afterlife are the ones we leave behind. And so I just, I really value and appreciate uh, the memories and the moments now more than ever. And it's because of the struggles that I've been through. And I feel like you can't appreciate the good stuff if you haven't gone through incredible hardships. So that's my rambling for this section of the podcast. <laughs> um, and, and once again, I'm falling deeper and deeper in love with you. So that makes sense. Um, I told you, man. Uh, you did, you did. You, well, and you know me well enough to know what kind of, what kind of people I, I like and, and, I was so excited to to land this interview with you even before we started talking, and now I'm just hoping that we can get you on again. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. What? Uh, but again, I got to enjoy the moment that we're in right now, right? Because this is right. over. Great. Right. Got to appreciate um, it. Now, with all this extra time, uh, well, actually, you know, you probably have a little bit less free time than maybe other professional wrestlers right now, because you said you're staying busy. You still have some bookings in in areas that are. Uh, open enough to be able to, to allow it to happen. But, and we can get into that before this is over and make sure that, that we plug everything that you're in so all these people can know where to find you. But uh, when you do have some free time, what do you like to do with uh, outside hobbies, interests, things like that? 
I'm super simplistic, man. I like uh, retro video games. Like I have an emulator. So, you know, anything above PS2 becomes a problem for me. Uh, but, uh, but I have, a, I have this like little portable emulator that I'll take with me to hotels and stuff on the road, just because, you know, it's like, it, what a world we live in where I can just have every video game ever for Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega, uh, PlayStation, just at the palm of my hands, you know, uh, or hand in this case. And, uh, like, I, so I like that. I obviously love lifting weights, which, um, for me, it's very therapeutic because like my brain I'm constantly overthinking. Like I think and I think and I overthink. And the only time that I can really focus and uh, have my best thoughts, both good and bad, um, if that makes sense. Like I, yeah. there's a lot of stuff going through my brain. Like everything I try to relate to pro wrestling. Again, it's like a Stone Cold Steve Austin thing where he would say in documentaries back in the day, like everything I see, I try to think like, how would I use that for my character, this and that. And like, I could do that best when I'm at the gym and I'm like, I'm listening to music and lyrics are connecting with me emotionally. And, and uh, I don't know, it's very therapeutic for me. That's why when the gyms closed down for a little bit, boy, was that rough for me because I, you know, that's, that was my therapy. And uh, I like road trips, uh, even if it's not for wrestling, I've really appreciated that. Um, through my travels over the years. So just get in the car and driving. It's therapeutic. I listen to my music, uh, get some podcasting in, you know, listen, uh, listen to some thoughts from some other people. Uh, I like terrible movies. I, I like going and just eating good food at restaurants and people watching and observing and, you know, observation humor is incredibly important to me. And like being able to see the hilarity and the unintentional hilarity in every aspect of life, because I just want to laugh. I think I think most people like search forever about what the meaning of life is. And I don't know if I have the exact answer, but I'd like to think that a large part of the meaning of life is just being able to laugh and love. And that sounds like something you should like buy at Walmart and then hang on your kitchen wall. <laughs> but uh, really, if you can't laugh and, and love things or, and do the things that you're passionate about, what's even the point, you know? And you don't need a Walmart sign because you have that rare quality that most people don't have, which is the knowledge of that fact already in your head and in your heart and you're living it out and yeah. putting it in the practice. Um, you know, and you know, here, here in just the, the few things that you said, Cass, I feel bad that, uh, uh, one of the other podcasts on, on Body Slam is run by our buddy uh, Topher McCain, uh, the Brocast podcast. And John, I think, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I think, um, Honestly, I think it would be uh, one that you would be interested in because they actually do reviews of, of bad movies uh, and uh, bad music albums too and stuff like that. Dude. Well, I, their, their big thing is called Notes on Notes and they do uh, when celebrities do albums that, um, you know, after the fact, they'll review those. But they also do a thing called Movie Night. We made a huge mistake that they uh, used to do a lot more that uh, they, they do that. They just find bad movies and they review them. Uh, one of the last ones they did was Killing Hasselhoff that I think is on Netflix now. It is. And, I think it um, is. And I, I believe the original theory of, it was basically like a death pool, like a celebrity death pool. Um, and I think the original uh, person that they were going to get for that was even Hulk Hogan. Uh, and yeah, he ended yeah, up being... They, they, they cut him out of the movie because of yeah, all the racist stuff. Yeah. Right. But... Um, but yeah, so anyway, just to just to put them on blast and also put it in your ears since you're big on podcasts, you also have your own podcast that I'm probably probably gonna Dude, listen to every single it's episode now. So I, good. It's so good. I, I don't ever want to hear you stop talking. <laughs> I, I absolutely I don't listen to a whole lot of podcasts, but I, I always listen to Greg's show. I mean when I, when you told me you were doing it, I, I I was telling you how much I was behind that idea, man. I think I was even talking to you before you decided to do it, trying to get you to do something with us like a long time ago and you were trying to figure out how to how to work it and how you're going to do it. And I think what yeah. you're doing with your show is the, it's perfect, man. I, I love your, I love your work, man. Thanks, man. Like the, the podcast has been uh, super cool for me because I get to tell a lot of stories that sometimes I might not get asked about in interviews. And I get to talk about wrestling psychology, which I love doing in seminars now when I, I, I help younger students, which is weird to even be in that position where I'm uh, I'm at a level where people will pay me to, help train them. Uh, maybe I can't do it as good physically because of my disability. I'm obviously very limited in my moveset, but I'd like to think more important than showing people the moves is like helping people with the understanding of why you do the moves, where, and the little things in between, because that helped me so much um, when I started wrestling, because I, I trained alongside Johnny Gargano and Johnny is 
arguably the best wrestler in the world. And so, and he, and he was good from day one and far more advanced than me, uh, despite us having roughly. When you're training with a guy like that, when he comes training with five new moves, you think right. that you need five new moves as well. And I would do five new moves, super shitty, trying to keep up with Johnny. And then when I realized, you know, you focus on the positives, um, hide the negatives, um, and that my favorite wrestler of all time was Hulk Hogan, uh, I worried more about the transitions and the storytelling aspect. And even though I can't wrestle necessarily like a Chris Jericho or a Shawn Michaels that I love so much, um, I can do the little things in between that mean so much more. And instead of being like a Chris Jericho copycat or a Shawn Michaels copycat or a Johnny Gargano copycat, I can be the first Gregory Iron, you know, and take all those aspects from so many guys that I love and aspire to be like and create my own wrestler out of it. And so, uh, you know, it, it's nice to be able to just delve into things like that on the podcast and tell silly stories with my co-host, Aaron Bauer, who I think is one of the most underrated minds in wrestling. And again, I'm biased, but I came up with him in Cleveland. Uh, he traveled throughout the Midwest as like a manager and a promoter and a commentator for a long time. And I always thought like just his, his insight on wrestling and the way he commentated wrestling in a lot of ways, his humor was that of like a modern day Bobby Heenan. Uh, definitely not like and that that's that's uh saying a lot too i was gonna say it's high praise that's very high praise <laughs> bobby Heenan is on like another level but like just the way aaron delivers things sometimes as a commentator he doesn't commentate anymore but just i knew when i was launching the podcast if i was if i was gonna have someone at my side i wanted it to be aaron just because we play off each other so well he's kind of an idiot i'm kind of an idiot in a different way and then i could be when he's being more of an idiot i could be the straight man and um just I value him so much and together we've been growing the podcast over the last year. It's, it's literally going to be a year, I think on September 23rd that we've been doing it. And it doesn't feel like a year at all. We've been growing the Patreon. We've been putting extra content over there, like uh, bonus episodes, extended episodes, early episodes, bonus videos. I've been taking a lot of Aaron's old shows when he promoted shows in the nineties, like with, ECW guys like Tracy Smothers or Tommy Rich or Sabu or Rob Van Dam when he would bring these guys in um, these these shows never made it onto the internet so now we've been putting those up on Patreon these are just weird random ass shows from Ohio back in the 90s with these guys that just like had it not been up for us putting it on the internet you know they would never exist to people and so it's it's been nice to really expose people to that and uh, I'm just having a blast, man, just interacting with the fans. And the Patreon community is incredible. Like those people have become not just patrons, but they feel like real friends and, and family members. And I talk to them almost daily about stuff. And it just, it's so encouraging to have that type of support, especially in this awkward time that we're living in. I was going to say, especially now where it's really the, the most accessible way to, or the easiest way to remain accessible to fans that would otherwise be able to come out to shows and get to talk to you, chat with you and, you know, buy some merch, really be able to uh, support you. So that's awesome. Um, yeah. And you can, I'm, I'm sure that's all on your, on your social media, uh, your Patreon and all that as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. You go on my social media, you'll be able to find uh, the podcast, which is available on iTunes or wherever you download podcasts. And of course, the Patreon is available at patreon.com slash iron on wrestling. So just search iron on wrestling. It'll pop right up. And uh, coming up, you, I know you have a few bookings, one of which that's definitely announced and ready to go is the, uh, the Indie Collective, correct? Yeah. That's the Annapolis. Yes. The 9th, 10th and 11th, particularly I'll be a part of Joey Janela's spring break with 440. Nice. And that's, uh, that's, I mean, that's a, a whole big event. That's not just one day. That's like you said, it's a few days. Uh, that's in Indianapolis, correct? Yes, Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, there's so many events happening around that weekend as part of the collective. You got Janela's spring break. I think Jimmy Lloyd's doing a show for GCW. AIW will be there. Black Label Pro will be there. Uh, so many events that I can't even think of at this time, but it's 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 going to be three days of nonstop fun and pro wrestling. So it, is Effie still doing his show? Effie is still doing his show, okay, the Big yeah. Dude Brunch. That's going to happen. Effie is one of the most incredible wrestlers I've met in recent times. Just a great mind for wrestling, but also a great businessman. And not, not, not enough guys treat wrestling like a business. So I really respect Effie and what he's doing out there. I mean, he's, he's the man. Oh, I love that. He's great, man. One of my favorites. I, I think the last time I spoke to him was in Chicago 
for when he was doing Black Label last okay. year, I think. But yeah, he's a great dude, man. I love Effie. I love every time I get to see him, man. He's good. He's awesome. Yeah. Guys, you're trying to get out there to that uh, those shows too, I've, correct? I'm kicking it around, man. It's it's not too far out of my my travel range. I can get to Indianapolis and a half a day's drive. You know, it's five five and a half hours, a little bit more like that. And I, I don't know. I'm thinking about it, man. It just really depends on how the next couple of weeks go for me, man. I uh, I'm closing on a on a, on a but we're selling my house, my condo, so I should have some money. So if I got some money, man, I'm gonna come up and try to spend it and go get out of here because I haven't done anything since I saw you, man, in Philly for my birthday in March. So it's been yeah. well overdue, man. I hear you, and uh, I keep looking at the time and knowing that we got to wrap it up. But I just I just don't want to, Greg. I mean, I'm, not, I'm, <laughs> I'm good to keep going until you guys are, but. I got, I got so much stuff I could talk to Greg about because some of my two of my all time favorite programs that you worked is the one you did with Veda, and it was a, that ended up in a that ended in a bloodbath, man. That match was, if I remember correctly, was aw- was awesome. And then there was one in Canada, wasn't there? A really really bloody program that you had for somewhere up in I can't remember who that was with. Was that? It wasn't Ricky, was it? You were wrestling Ricky Shane Page in Canada, were you? Yeah, yeah, we had a dog collar match. Which yeah, uh, that's the one. That's the one. Okay, yeah. And was that in Smash or was that Alpha One? Where uh, was Alpha that? One. Alpha One. Okay, dude, those two, that and the Veda program, were two of my favorites that you've done, man. And those two matches were some of the, dude. That was so much blood. Like, if anybody hasn't seen those, they need to look those up. It's fucking unreal, man. It was something else. Yeah, no, it, those are the the feud with Veda and uh, the thing with Ricky are two of the things I'm most proud of in wrestling. And it's just sometimes when you have um, such a strong friendship with people outside the ring, uh, that chemistry translate into the ring. And uh, we, were, we were able to tell an incredible story with Veda and just, um, it wasn't so much that it was woman versus man, but just, I think it was one of those first storylines where, um, you know, intergender wrestling was becoming so popular. And just the idea that like, we're just two people, you know what I mean? And like, like there were, there were obviously elements of like romance and like sexual creepiness. And for like some of the ways you progress that storyline too, you're using, what was that uh, little cartoon thing that was going on at the time? It was like a little, it was all on the internet. You know what I'm talking about? What's that? What was that called? You're using all those little gimmicks and things that are that are popular to just progress this and make it so much. What was that cartoon strip thing that the internet, bit those bit strips. Yes. Yeah. You're using those. Man, I was I was loving that, dude. It was very original and very you it was ahead of its time, really, because I mean people hadn't been doing stuff like that really yet. And you yeah, dude, I love that feud. I, I always tell that to people to go look up that your your stuff there with her. Was that an AIW? Yeah, that was an AIW. And and the bit strips thing it was one of those things where as, again, not just as a bad guy, but as a person, people were really annoyed by the bit strips to the point where they were blocking them. So I would make the bit strip in the app. And then I would screen cap it and then crop it and then add stuff to it because I wanted everyone to see it. And it got to the point where, you know, again, at the time I was with my long-term girlfriend, um, people were believing it so much, including members of my family, where <laughs> my, my brother's girlfriend uh, was like, have you seen, uh, have you seen uh, the bit strips that Greg is posting on this girl's wall? Uh, it's really creepy. Does his girlfriend know about this? And so, oh, that's so good. You you worked him, man. You you got him. You got them all. <laughs> right, right. Like when you're creating this emotional investment, like that, even your family is questioning what you're doing. You got them. Hook, you did it right, man. You nailed it. You couldn't have done it any better. It was, and I think that's what made that program and that feud so good is because it was so believable to where like, I think I, cause people knew that you and I were friends kind of, and we were, we, we talked often. So I had people asking me like, what's going on with this man? Is this real? Or is this just a storyline? I'm like, I was just laugh. I'm like, I don't know, man. What do you think? And just let people <laughs> just run with it. You know I mean? Let them try to figure it out on their own, man. I love yeah. doing that too. But it's, yeah, that was, that's some really good work, man. And, and the storytelling that you do too, you were talking about like the psychology and how you try to, there's things you can't do in the ring. So you try to make up for it in other ways. And I think just that is just something that sets you apart from everybody else is your ability to tell a good story and stretch it out and just really get it for all it's worth. And it's just, it's just, it's something that it's very lost in this business now. And it's something that I think you do better than most. And there's some money to be made, man. If somebody capitalizes on that, dude, I'm telling you, people need to pay attention and not sleep I, on you, man. I, it's there's money to be made with you, dude. I've, I've been t- saying that for years. 
I appreciate that, man. It means a lot. I, I just, I just try to work hard. And I think uh, more than anything, I'm passionate about wrestling, you know, and I think, you know, passion is a universal language and you don't have to understand wrestling to see that I'm passionate about it. And I think at some point, you know, um, it, it's taken me longer in some areas than I would have liked to, to get on people's radars, but um, wrestling is a, is, is a waiting game. You know what I'm saying? You got to have patience and, and it's not going to happen overnight for everyone. I've been at this for 14 years now and I'm still grinding. I'm still working my ass off and I wouldn't have it any other way. Well, I guess I would have it any other way, but you know, it makes you appreciate those great things when they finally uh, come at you. You know, I've, I've done yeah. some incredible things that, you know, 15 year old Greg, uh, had he known he'd, he'd be shocked by, you know, the, just the fact that I can, call or text Stone Cold Steve Austin whenever I want and he actually communicates with me it's a mind fuck man Dude, that's like, okay. yeah that's a dream come true to any wrestling fan right I mean yeah yeah it's yeah. it's weird shit like I, I me and Johnny were having this discussion um last year where it was like um you know he's really close with Shawn Michaels now because Shawn trains at the performance center he trains those yeah. guys and like we were just having this conversation of like what kind of world do we live in where you're texting and calling Shawn Michaels and I'm texting and calling Stone Cold Steve Austin, the two guys that wrestled each other at WrestleMania 14 and essentially ushered in the attitude era. Why would they even want to talk to us? And it was just kind of one of those things of like, let's just roll with it, man. Let's, let's yeah. just go with it. Like that's the question. Let's, let's, let's go, you know, like let's, let's keep moving. So yeah. it's pretty humbling. Well, and your, your humble nature um, is I think why it's so easy for those stars to really, want to go the extra mile i mean there's a million reasons why but i think the fact that you appreciate it and you're not somebody that feels like you're entitled to it um despite the I, I, in addition to the fact that i think you're just your your mindset is just so um warm and welcoming you know what i mean like it, it's so inviting to people who would want to you know help you out as much as you're helping them out so i uh again i um i'm just so happy to have you on and I sound more and more like a Mark, but if you could, uh, I got one more question here as far as ones that I just wrote down, but if you, could I got one, when you finish with that, that's from one of our, uh, somebody else on the stage. Cause we, we, I tagged some people yesterday. I was like, Hey, shoot me some questions for Greg. And one of our fellow writers on the website had some questions. So when you finish with yours, let me know. And I got one here from, from, uh, Anthony, uh, one of our writers. So. All I want to know is if, uh, once everything opens back up for, for wrestling, if, uh, if, if we're up to you completely to land anywhere on the national market, where would you want to be wrestling and taking your talents? Who? Uh, well, I mean, there's so many great places to be right now, but um, I think the perfect fit for me uh, and probably for the 440 guys uh, as a group would be somewhere like AEW. I mean, I feel like, especially, you know, right off the bat, AEW wanted to prove that they're all inclusive and they wanted to sign people outside of the norm. And, uh, you know, just the fact that they've invested so much time in people like Nyla Rose and, uh, and Sonny Kiss and people that, uh, you know, guys and gals that like don't exactly fit the mold of like what someone like a WWE would sign. And, uh, I really appreciate and respect that because I think we've learned over the past five years of indie wrestling as um, the world has become smaller due to streaming services that it's not a big man's game anymore. You know, you don't have to be a body guy necessarily. It's about talent and heart and charisma and more importantly, the human connection. You know, there's some guys that you might look at at face value. I mean, I, I, me, I'm a perfect example. You see me and I tell you that I'm a pro wrestler that might not connect with you right away, but if you see me in the ring and what I do, like there's this human connection that like, I don't know, like it, it just, it just happens in that moment. You know, you look at a guy like Joey Janela that again, on paper doesn't look like a, the stereotypical pro wrestler, but like for some reason he's made this emotional connection with people over the last three to five years that has like propelled him to, you know, the top echelon of professional wrestling. And obviously he's proving that in AEW. So it's like, um, I, I think AEW is the perfect place to really showcase my talent and to be there with my friends, like, you know, Ricky Shane Page, Eric Ryan, Eddie Only, Atticus Coger. He's one of the most underrated young guys in professional wrestling right now. We've been killing it consistently. 
uh, the buzz that we've created through social media and through the videos that we've been placing on social media, it's second to none right now. Uh, there were some talks with some places before COVID, uh, but COVID ruined everything. Yeah. But uh, that's not to say that there would be any doors that closed in any areas. It's just, uh, and this goes for any wrestler out there who that feels like they're struggling right now or that they feel like they want to give up. You have to keep in mind that everything's on pause. You know, like I, I think uh, some, there was a wrestler who made a real dumb comment when this stuff happened about how um, just particularly that no one was going to remember or care about the 440 thing because of this break. And uh, I remember thinking to myself, that's really asinine because um, to kind of relate it to something else, you know, I was really pumped for Ghostbusters coming out this year. I'm a big Ghostbusters fan. And um, it wasn't announced at the time, but I remember saying, you know, if Ghostbusters gets put on hold, uh, I'm not going to forget that Ghostbusters was a movie coming out this summer. I'm kind of going to anticipate what happens next even more. And now that it's coming out, I think in March of next year, I'm like salivating for Ghostbusters. You know, I want it more yeah. than ever. And so like, that was kind of my mindset with the 440 thing. At first it was depressing because we had so much momentum. In February, we caused a near riot in, in Philadelphia and New Jersey, which is unheard Bad. of in 2020. That was, look that up. If you haven't watched that, that was, that, that, I think I saw some footage of that, man. That was, yeah. It was crazy. You were, start, you were starting riots in Philly before it was commonplace. Oh man! Yeah, well, no, I can't. Say, I can't go that far. Nah, nah, uh, nah. We, we were bringing them back to wrestling. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, like it, man, it literally yeah. felt like in that moment. You know, I immediately thought of like the NWO and Bash at the Beach '96, and I was like, you know, this just doesn't happen in this day and age. And so when everything got put on pause, it was kind of disheartening at first. But then I thought, no way, everybody's going to want it more, and. We, we stayed quiet on social media for a little bit, but once shows started picking up again, it's like we never stopped. So it's like, um, if you're a wrestler who's like worried, just be patient because everything's gonna come back. It's like, it's not the end, it's just a break. You know, so like take this break to recover and get better and uh, maybe think of some new ideas. So when it does come back, you're ready to go. Yeah, I think that's a ridiculous statement. I think that probably more reflects his insecurities of what's going to happen to himself, let alone what, you know, take for you guys. Because I agree with you. The, we don't have it. It just makes you want it more instead of, you know, forgetting about it and not, you know, not caring anymore. And I, I think that's probably more that he was afraid that people were going to not care about that him and, you know, he's going to be forgotten. So he was just projecting outward because, no, I, I disagree with that, especially as good a work you do. People are going to forget about that. Yeah. Hey, yo, it might have been a she. Oh, she. Yeah, I don't remember. But whoever, you know what I mean? Whoever it was, yeah. the person. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. But whatever, you know. Yeah. But yeah. What was, uh, did, you said you had a question, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Why? Well, I, I was surprised nobody asked, wanted me to ask you about the CM Punk thing, but uh, Anthony. I didn't, was, I didn't ask because I figured you're probably tired of talking about that at this point. I mean, it's whatever, man. I'll, yeah. I'll always think about that. I mean, it's it's the reason why I, I make money as a wrestler, you know? So, like, I'll yeah. always be thankful for that moment and for that spotlight from a guy who only knew my story through Cole Cabana. You know, Cole Cabana and CM Punk are both equally responsible for that moment in Chicago in 2011. And, uh, man, just a humbling thing. And, like, the one thing that I always mentioned that um, it was the best part of that was afterwards when I asked Cabana why he did it. And he said – don't ask why just take it as a gift mm. and it's your job to run with this gift. And I'll never forget that. That meant so much to me. Yeah. And, uh, not, not that I would, not, that this isn't me trying to correct you at all, but you said that was, uh, you know, how you made your money in pro wrestling. But like you said, that happened in 2011. How many people had, had a buzz in 2011 and are not making money the way you are in pro wrestling today. So True. Anybody can take that, you know, like you called it a gift, but, you know, what you've done with it in the decade that, you know, um, existed since then is not a testament to Colt Cabana or CM Punk or anybody other than yourself. And it hasn't been what has defined you either. It's not like – Exactly. Uh, only, it, that's not what people only know you for. And that's that might have been the first time a lot of people saw you or were exposed to you, but that's definitely not what you're remembered for. You know what I mean? And it easily could have been. But like you said, it's what you do with it, and you you ran with it, and you were able to really use that uh, boost into the spotlight to 
to show everybody who you are and what you can do, man. And it's that I no, that's what everything from 2011 on has been just great for you, man. I, that's when I think you and I first really got to be friends was probably about that time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. But uh, I uh, yeah, no, go ahead, no, go ahead, man. No, what were you gonna say? Uh, one thing that I wanted to say, and I, I wanted to make sure that I I say it so that it doesn't come off as uh, as the the wrong way, but it's it's it seems like you've taken a disability and you've turned it into a capability. And that to me is just beautiful. And I, I don't say that to diminish what you've gone through or anything, um, but just so few people I think can, can say that about uh, their own struggles and your struggles are, are so much, so much more than the average person. And I think it's, it's really noble to be able to say that you've, you've taken your disability and you've really turned it into a capability for yourself. I appreciate that. But, but also, you know, keep in mind that like my situation is physical, right? I think um, to say that I, I struggle more than someone else is like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't, I don't want to like, uh, demean anyone else. It's one of those things where like, we're all, we all have our own personal struggles, whether it be physical or mental. And it's, um, it's how you face those struggles and deal with them that like shape who you are. Right. And so uh, I'm just very fortunate to be in the position that I'm in and to be given the opportunities I've been given and just to make the most of them. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for it every day. And uh, just the fact that I could share my story and inspire others. You know, when I look in the mirror, I'm just Greg. But um, if someone gets something special out of my story and it pushes them to be better, then uh, that's what's important. That's, that's what really means the most for sure. Yeah, man, I, I love seeing some of the stuff you post of like some of the fans you've met and some of the, the kids that have reached out to you that also have disabilities and how they've connected with you and how, you know, and just how receptive you were and just how, you know, I mean, you've gone to visit people at their house and stuff. I've seen that. And like, who does? I mean, people don't do that, man. And it's just, yeah. you are, uh, you're, you're a class act, man. You're one of a kind, dude. I'm, I'm honored to be able to be able to call you my friend for a day. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yes. Did you have a, uh, I'm sorry. I think yeah. I interrupted uh, you. You oh, said you had another question, right? Yeah, I got, I got a question. Yeah, I got, I got a question from uh, one of my, one of my uh, writers on the, one of my news writers, he helps out. He, uh, Anthony Wade, he said, he wants to know who was coming up with the tag team names in the PWO circa 2012. And he gave the examples of the homeless handicapped connection, the mustachioed <laughs> brawlers and the handicapped handguns and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah. Pro Wrestling Ohio was a big part of my life, uh, especially because I was on Sports Time Ohio for six or seven years, and it, it gave me an opportunity to be exposed to a lot of people that we didn't even realize we were being exposed to. I mean, to this day, because if you had a satellite or cable package with, with a sports deal, people got Sports Time Ohio all over. And, uh, you know, I'll be like last year when I was in California, in Oakland, uh, like 12 people came up to me. And we're talking about my feud with Johnny Gargano and PWO that they watched back in 2007 and eight. And uh, it was, it was awesome, but it also pissed me off because we never realized the potential of that TV and uh, how much cooler it could have been. Uh, Jeremy Borash was talking to me last year and he was telling me about how he used to watch PWO all the time. And I was just like, what the hell? Like, so I, I really wish we would have taken advantage of that TV a little more than we did. But um, as far as the names, uh, a lot of the, the guys were coming up with their own names. I know me and Hobo Joe, we came up with Homeless Handicap Connection just because uh, it just made the most sense. <laughs> and it, was, it was kind of a take on the uh, Rock and Sock Connection. It was like this, um, you know, uh, misfit tag team type deal. Two guys that went together that didn't make any sense. But then once we started rolling, it made perfect sense. Um, the uh, Mustachio Brawlers and uh, the Megalomaniacs, they uh, – they came up with their own names. The handicapped handguns were something that me and Zach Allen came up with because when we first started talking about being a team, he said, we need something cool like the Motor City machine guns. And so I said, well, what were the handicapped handguns? I mean, that was <laughs> now we had to change it when we started speaking in schools. That's why we became the handicapped yeah. heroes. It was a little bit harder to take uh, the word handguns into a, a school, but um yeah, well, a lot of the creativity came from the guys themselves. And uh, I think that's the beauty of pro wrestling. It's like 
you know, we live in an era where like everything's wrote and scripted very heavily. And sometimes if you just got, give the guys a little leeway, and I think we've seen that in WWE over the past few months during the pandemic where they've kind of changed the way they formatted TV and they let the guys be a little bit looser on TV. Like perfect example is Drew McIntyre. You let the guy be himself a little bit and that shows through the TV more than anything that could be written for you. So just give the guys a little bit of creative freedom. Now, granted, there are some guys that need their hand held for sure. But I mean, when you can, when you can add a little bit of an element of yourself into what you're doing, it makes it realer. I mean, that, I think that applies for any, anything, including professional wrestling. And um, also to like get off on like a tangent, that's also like one of the biggest problems we have in this cancel culture too, is that um, while we are able to incorporate elements of ourselves, you know, the whole line over the years that's always been is like, what's your wrestling character? And then you say, well, I'm just me turned up to 11. I feel like we need to stop saying that because like sometimes we do things as wrestlers and performers that we would not do as a real human being. Right. And so like, that's why, um, I think we have this problem with, with the blurred line of reality and fiction, particularly on social media, because if we say something on social media in character and no one says anything bad about it, it's just in character. But then if we say something in character and it gets backlash, and then we, we go back on social media and go, well, I was saying that in character. But how am I supposed to differentiate if you're going online or doing interviews where you say, well, I'm me turned up to 11. You can't say you're me, you're me turned up to 11, then you do a character where you're playing like, let's go real extreme, you, you're a Nazi or something, and you say the N word or something, you, then you can't go on social media and go, well, I, I was playing a character. But you go on other things and you say that you're, you turned up to 11. So which is it? Like, I think that's something that we need to separate. We need to understand that, like, while I am Gregory Iron, um, there is a Greg Smith and Gregory Iron might do something like hit a woman like Veda Scott in the face with a beer bottle and bloody her and be super creepy and make bit strips. Whereas Greg Smith would not do something like that. You know, I always go to the example of like Rikishi, you know, I don't think Rikishi was going around uh, committing vehicular homicide and running down people like Stone Cold Steve Austin in his real life. I'm pretty sure that was a wrestling storyline. So I think we need to start better separating the two entities so that, um, you know, maybe one day we can be classified more as actors and we can start embracing more storytelling with darker elements because we don't have to worry about the concern of like, well, that guy saying this because he's him turned up to 11. That's a, that's a very big tangent that I went off on there. I'm sorry. No, you no. touched on something, you touched on something that I it made me, so you said actors. Now this whole thing with McMahon and the third party stuff brought up Andrew Yang talking about, Oh, and the Screen Actors Guild and then try to unionize. I saw them talking about that and how they were, you know, comparing you guys to actors and how there's a, you know, an actors union, there should be one for you. And I was, they were talking about that. And it's, it, it's, no, it makes, it's, it connects right now with what's really topical and how, you know, you guys are independent contractors with, you know, really no benefits anywhere. And, you know, you, that's not right. You guys kind of need that union and it's, you are actors, you know, I mean, you guys really are actors that, you know, tell a physical story. So you should be treated like that kind of as well too. And there's, I don't know, there's something to be said for what you said of how you wish people would maybe take you and look at you that way, because I mean, like, I mean, it is what it is, right? I mean, yeah. shit, I mean, like, so. if, if you're good at what you do, you could still create emotional investment. It's not like, um, I mean, listen, everyone is in on the joke. Okay. It's 2020. Like if you're watching wrestling, chances are you're not watching it because you think it's real. You, you have enough of emotional investment to be able to suspend your disbelief. So why can't we just kind of be out front and say, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a real person. You know what I mean? Like, I, look, I understand that chances are when people see me on the street, they're not going to call me Greg Smith, nor do I necessarily want that. I often forget Greg Smith is, like, is a thing. But like, you know, there are some subjects that I wish we could tackle in pro wrestling that we tackle in movies, no problem. And no one thinks twice about it. But you know, like you do it in wrestling and it's like, oh my God, like I can't believe they said this or this or that crossed the line. You know, like I'm one of those guys that um, while it wasn't done in the right fashion, you know, uh, I look back at like, say Katie Vick. I'm not offended by that. Okay. I'm offended by it because it like 
was poorly done, but like I didn't look at it like, oh my god, this guy was having sex with a corpse. You know, like there's a right and wrong way to do yeah. storylines. You know, I, I I feel like if wrestling is done right, nothing nothing is off limits. But um, again, it comes down to we have to get to a point where we can separate the character from the person. And I don't know if that's ever a possibility because you know some of these guys get so wrapped up in their character that there's no in between. You know, it's hard to differentiate the two. One yeah. of the only examples I could think of that is Ethan Page. Like he even puts it on his Twitter. You know, it's like uh, he puts his name Julian, whatever, or however he phrases it. But he puts his real name and his you know wrestling name, and he points out that he's playing that character. And not many, nobody yeah. really does that. And I think he's one of the only people that I've seen. And that's, I mean, that's the way he does it. You know, I mean, it's on his Twitter handle, but like he's saying what you just said. Like I, there's a difference between Ethan Page and Julian, and yeah, you know, yeah. So. Any uh, any other questions that came in from uh, social uh, media? Uh, shit, I wasn't looking, man. That's the one that I saw last night. But I did see you had that last night. But yeah, I man, I've gotten. I'm sure there's a couple, but I'm, I don't know. What do you got? You got any? You got anything I'll, you've seen? I'll tell you what, because it didn't feel like it, but we've been going over an hour, so we uh, maybe by, might be best to, to wrap it up here, so that this that is works. an exceptionally long episode. Um, Unless uh, unless we scare Greg away, if this is the only chance that we can get him, then I want to keep him in, until uh, until the cops come for the hostage situation. Because I just <laughs> love talking to you, man. Um, I can come back. I can come back. That's that makes my day to hear that because we would love to have you back on any time that you're available. Um, thank you so much for this. This was uh, I was so excited for this, and this was even even more of a joy than I could have imagined that it would be talking to you. So so thank you, Cass. Thank you for for setting oh, this up. And uh, to make sure that we, we properly plug everything that you have going on, just to, to circle back around, you are going to be in the Indie Collective. Uh, what are the, the days of that again? The, the 9th, 10th? October 9th, 10th, and 11th. Yeah, 11th. That. And, uh, of course, if you want to find me on social media, you can find me at Gregory Iron on Twitter, at Gregory underscore Iron on Instagram because some asshole took at Gregory Iron and he never uses it. Uh, I'm on Facebook. You can find my pro wrestling tees at prowrestlingtees.com slash Gregory Iron. Go to my website, gregory-iron.com if you want to book me for wrestling, motivational speaking, uh, when that becomes more prevalent thing. And uh, of course, listen to Iron on Wrestling every Wednesday when it drops on iTunes. And even your motivational speaking before we run off the air, um, it, that's something that you're, you're willing to, I know you, it's something probably get, gets lost in the effect, uh, but that's something that you're still willing to do via Zoom as well, right? If there's schools or, or clubs, groups that, that want to book you for, for your speaking skills, uh, they can do that remotely via Zoom as well, correct? Yes. In this COVID world, if you still want to have a speaking engagement, we could do it via Zoom. I would love to do that. Beautiful. Cass, you got any, uh, any final thoughts before we... Uh, <laughs> do our award-winning yeah. outro no nah, man I'm, i think we covered pretty much everything i could think of the time we could keep talking all day like you said but i think we got enough in this one for now we'll we'll pick this up on another date with greg and we'll we'll, we'll wrap it up today greg thank you so much again and uh sit back and enjoy as we take you out with our podcast podcast podcast, podcast with Dom and Cass.